Okay, we're gonna get started. We have a bit of a delay already. So this is the final presentation of the SPAT project under CESAR Work Package E. Uh, this was a project about resilience, functional resonance methods, and a lot of other issues that Alberto will introduce. The project was being executed by a consortium composed of Deep Blue as a coordinator, IRIT, which is the computer science department of the University of Toulouse, Paul Sabatier, and Armin, which is the research branch of Ecole des Mines in Paris Tech. Now, they are not present today, but the other two partners are present today, and I leave it to Alberto to introduce the whole team, not everybody is here, uh, as he goes into his presentation. So the title is System Performance Under Automation Degradation. So thank you and uh, welcome to everybody for this uh, uh, closure meeting and uh, overall presentation of our results. Welcome also to our uh, Brussels guests if they, they can uh, hear us. The presentation will be about the results of the project and the application in a case study. As uh, Mark explained, the, the team is composed by three companies. The Blue is uh, the, the coordinator of the project, IRIT, the University of Toulouse, or the University of Toulouse, uh, that is represented by Philippe Palanque and Celia Martin. Uh, Armin Paritec, uh, that is not present at the meeting, but that collaborated to the project. Let's start the presentation. Let me introduce a little bit the context under which the project was planned and originated. The main aspect is the strategy of Cesar regarding to automation. One of the basic idea of Cesar is to increase ATM efficiency capacity to deal with the traffic increase and the new business challenges. So this increase of automation is one of the basic elements for for all these uh, solutions that have been identified in uh, SPAD. So it's uh, something that is, uh, let's say, key elements in all the solution uh, identified. And automation is intended to support and also in some long-term cases even completely replace human in, the, in their role. The idea is that human can move uh, to more strategic role, to more supervision activities from a concept where operators are in the loop towards an approach where operators are over the loop. However, there are still some problems unsolved with the automation as uh, well-known problems because automation brings a set of new challenges, including those that are related to degradation. This is just an example is that, that you can see is the last Federal Aviation Administration report that was just released. The date is uh, 5th of September. The Federal Aviation Administration evidences all the problems that are uh, arising from automation. This is especially focused on cockpit, but most of them are related related with the ATM as well are uh, problems that are also common in the ATM domain. And these are problems uh, especially generated when something uh, unexpected happens and the control retards to human that have, uh, in most of the cases, have been out of the loop. There are also some other problems. Usually high level of automation implies standardization and high efficiency. And this is uh, often associated with a low flexibility to deal with uh, unexpected on the planet events and uh, also to deal with failure. This is something that we will see in our case study and that will be discussed again in my presentation after. Highly automated components are usually also tightly interconnected and, and then for this reason it's difficult to detect and isolate failures before they propagate to the whole system. Under this context, there was the proposal of the SPAD project, so the aims of the SPAD were to understand, model and estimate the propagation of automation degradation in ATM, evaluate and estimate the consequences of this degradation and propagation of degradation on, uh, on ATM performances, and support an intervention to try to deal with this problem and try to contain automation degradation. Considering this context and these objectives, my presentation will focus on the solution that we have uh, identified and adopted to, to deal with this problem. The case studies and the tools that were developed to revise and focus and improve these solutions, the conclusions about the applicability of the approach and the main results from the initial analysis that we have generated. 
The idea is here that the ATM is seen as a system of systems. The different systems that are elements of the ATM combine the resources and capability to achieve common goal. So when you have to deal with system and system, you have uh, several problems. One is that you need to consider multiple levels and domains. There is an overall complexity because you have a variety of systems that are combining their effort and sometimes there is a level of uncertainty that remains in their behavior and their interaction. If you look at ATM in this way, if you look at ATM as a system of systems, one of the possible solutions that we experimented in SPAD is to use multiple models that analyze the system from different perspectives and also at various levels of granularities. Models are used in a context in which they can collaborate with each other and exchange the information so are used within the context of a federation. This is a very rough sketch that is taken from the proposal presentation. You can see a system that is split in different elements and you have, can have a different model, one uh, oriented to the interaction, another one that is a functional oriented model, another one that is a behavioral oriented model, and they look at different parts of the system and also different levels of granularity. But this is just to give a very rough idea of the approach. So what are the models that were selected? We thought to models that were dealing in part with the functional aspects. So in practice, this was the functional resonance analysis model from describe the system in terms of function and interaction between functions. Then there is a second model that is uh, hamsters. Hamsters is a human-centered and is focusing on human interaction with the system and focuses on the related timing properties. And ICO, uh, we will discuss the application of ICOs because it was uh, more limited than the other two. And this was focusing on interaction between systems. Alberto, can you please mention again uh, clearly what were the criteria for the selection of these models? Because yeah, you mentioned it. Yes, I will come to this later. Uh, uh, there is a brief description. It's a pity there is a slide that would be interested, but it's not in the overall presentation. It is in the closure. But, uh, but I will uh, discuss this a little bit. From a uh, look at the system as a set of functions and investigate their interaction between those functions. Frank considers each function on the basis of six relations with the other functions. And these are input-output relation, preconditions, resources, controls, and timing. These are the elements that Fram is taking into account. Each function is analyzed to see how the input that it receives from the other functions influence the quality of the output. So it's essentially pretty much focused on the relationship between the function and how each can affect the others and in case produce what is called the resonance phenomenon. Identify a specific scenario. In that scenario, try to understand and derive all the coupling that can be generated among the different functions. Amsters uh, instead support the identification of the tasks that are at the basis of an activity or a function. If you want, it's a specialized type of task analysis uh, where the Amster notation embeds several types of function, human, automated system, interactive tasks. Tasks are represented as a special node in a hierarchical structure and the temporal relationships are described by operators and quantitative time is represented by expressing task duration, minimum, maximum execution time and delay before task availability. ECO instead is a formal description technique that is dedicated to modeling of the interaction, use concept from uh, object-oriented uh, approach and uh, to describe the structural static aspects of the system and use a high level petri nets for their dynamic and behavioral aspects. Is able to provide a very fine grain representation of the interaction. And this is why we could apply only to a limited extent. We made some experiment with a, with a small system, but it was then a bit difficult to use it in more complex system because of the effort that is uh, involved in this fine grain representation for when, when you have different type of interactions. How this was organized? We had uh, two layers based on front model. One layer that was at the upper level of the single system with a higher level of granularity. 
and then uh, a second layer that was mo more focused on uh, what are the influence and how the problem propagates to large portion of the ATM system. In a certain sense, if you focus on a scenario, we have one problem with uh, we have uh, this system applied to one as ACC. And then a second layer at a lower level of granularity where you consider also nearby ACC, airports and related traffic and so on. This was uh, the way FRAM was applied. Amsters was essentially inside FRAM because I, I told you that we consider how the, the input produces an output in a one function and sometimes to study this, this was uh, especially when humans were involved or where timing aspects were more important, this was done with Amster. So support the analysis of the function outcome uh, with a more quantitative and rigorous analysis and also when humans are involved. One of the consequences of using FRAM and Amsters and also using these releases of FRAM and Amsters is that the analyst the person, the human, remains at the center of the work. So he uses FRAM, uses Amsters, but is the manager of this interaction. So he's, uh, he's using the presentation of FRAM, using Amsters when needed, using some collaboration between the two, but he's still at the core of the center. And usually the output of the analysis is stored in a kind of data repository where you have all the tables, all the representation that are produced from FRAM and then you use them uh, and use this representation for Amsterdam, for example, and then come back and so on, but the human remain at the center, considering the system under analysis and producing the outcome. That is a key issue. We, we were not in condition to automate this role, essentially because those models are thought as support to the analyst for doing his work. The interaction between the two was uh, managed by human and this had an, uh, uh, also an impact on the effort required and on the fact that it was not possible in practice to use it for uh, real-time analysis. What is uh, the role of the federation then? We define it within SPAD a process to apply the federation. This process is based on a certain step. We need to identify very well the object under investigation, so the system that we are going to study, its contextual conditions, what are the possible assumptions and simplification. This is uh, needed to be sure that Amsters and SPAD are referring to the same object. So we need to ensure that we have a, the two models are referring to something in common in order to assure the compatibility of the results. The second point that is essential for the federation is that the format that is used by Amster and uh, Fram is uh, compatible and, and that we use some representation that can be used in the other models. So the representation can be used in both models and we have a common data repository where we share these tables and data information that are needed for moving from one model to the other. What are the information that we obtain at the end of the process? What are the information that we can have as a result of the application of the process? What can the analyst achieve? You have the interaction that are possible between the different system functions and the consequences that this interaction can have and also if these consequences can affect the performance of the whole system. In other terms, we use the ER for this, uh, the measure of the function variability that is one of the measure of uh, FRAM. I will not go into detail about the definition of function variability, but let's say that the output, uh, the basic information that function variability provides you is uh, interaction between functions and consequences that this can have on the system. Using this idea of function variability, we can identify the functions that are potentially more influenced by the other and study possible mitigation solutions. So if we introduce something like a barrier or if we modify the procedure or do other actions, how this other action can modify the influence that function can produce on each other. And this information can be provided for all the ATM system at different levels of granularity. And we will see some examples uh, as soon as we move to the case study in, in a while. Stella, do you want me to talk a little bit of the models now or go ahead and then do it at the end of the presentation? 
the only aspect which I was interested in was for the criteria for the models, and if you could expand a little bit also on the federation aspect. So that was it, pretty much. Perhaps I could go ahead and then, uh, then at the end uh, come back to this point. Is that okay? Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Alberto. The Federation was refined and validated in two case studies, both from the ATM domain. One is the Arrival Manager. Arrival Manager is a tool that is used to support the identification of the optimal aircraft approach sequence. We can consider the Arrival Manager, if we consider the Parasuraman classification, we can consider it at a level of automation that is between two and three. And then in another case study with a much higher level of automation, this was the remotely piloted aircraft system where we have autonomous aircraft that are able to separate from each other and from the surrounding commercial traffic. And we consider an overall scenario and see what happens when problems occur to the system especially to the communication, and we will see it, and how this affects the overall commercial traffic around it. Here we are in the Parasuraman classification levels between 7 and 10, more or less. We consider three possible degradation events of a growing level of severity for each of these case study. And data about this second case study were generated with support of a simulator that we will present in a while. Here I'm reporting about this application uh, only, not, not about the AMAN application. This is a picture from the SPAD simulator. It's a representation of the Italian airspace. And you have uh, some possible uh, uh, flight path along these waypoints. And uh, we have four different ACC that are identified by the different colors. And uh, aircraft fly from, uh, there are four or five airports, I don't remember. You remember? Five. five airports. Uh, aircraft fly from uh, these five airports, choosing the best, the, the optimal routes, and these uh, uh, move uh, uh, around the, the network. And then you have uh, some uh, uh, unmanned aircraft that fly from one place to the other, from one segregated area to another segregated area. And while doing this, they cross the, the commercial flights, the, uh, the path of the commercial flights. If there is a, a possible conflict, let's assume that if this, uh, would this aircraft be in here, this uh, uh, a man at the vehicle would have given priority to him and, uh, and uh, before reaching his destination. So the commercial flights are controlled by uh, air traffic controller, simulated air traffic controller in this case, while the unmanned area vehicles are self-separated from each other and uh, self-separated from the commercial aircraft and giving priority to the commercial aircraft. That's the simulator part. This is a short summary of the characteristics. So we have uh, simulated the whole system with uh, several remote piloted aircraft that are able to separate from each other and separating from uh, the commercial aircraft using self-separation algorithms and the information based on satellites, ADSB. Remote pilot intervene only in case of malfunction on uh, unforeseen events or if this is required by a air traffic controller. This uh, emergency intervention of the remote pilot is uh, the reason why we called it remotely piloted aircraft, but in principle they are completely autonomous. If there are no problems, they are completely autonomous. Uh, commercial aircraft are managed by air traffic controller. In our simulator, the air traffic controller are simulated even if you can trigger specific action. And all the procedures for the remotely piloted aircraft system are in line, and also the way malfunctions are managed, are in line with the strategies that is proposed in ICONOS, the study that has been done for CESAR so, uh, about the initial CONOPS for uh, unmanned aerial systems. So what happens? If we simulate a malfunction, that, and the consequence of the malfunction is to lose the control of the unmanned aerial system, for example here, we don't know where it is at this moment, and it could cross this path, then the, the simulator generates 
uh, apply a rerouting strategy and generate new paths for the aircraft that are crossing the, the area. We generate a safety area here, and so the traffic is rerouted in order to avoid this area. This is done for the three possible uh, failures type. We consider three types of malfunction. These are in growing level of severity. One problem is that if we have uh, an interruption of the communication between the remote pilot aircraft and the remote pilot, the unmanned aircraft is still able to self-separate but cannot be monitored or supervised by the remote pilot. So it works well, but we are not in condition to do anything if it doesn't work, if there are problems. Second is uh, there is an interruption of communication and also a problem of self-separation algorithms. The remote pilot cannot intervene, the system is not self-separating anymore, but the air traffic controller is still able, using the ADSB to recognize that the emergency events is taking place and to identify the area of the problem. And the third scenario is that the, the problem mix the two problems here plus a problem on the self-localization device of the unmanned aerial uh, aircraft. So localization is only possible by radar, but not by ADS-B anymore. So these are the three problems in growing levels of severity. This produces, uh, of course, also a growing level of consequences on the commercial traffic that then must be reorganized and rerouted by the, by the controllers. When we generate this uh, scenario, what we have uh, in output from the simulator? We have a set of data that are related to traffic and also to the workload that is uh, imposed to the controllers. We have uh, information about the consequences of this perturbation, the consequences that we had on traffic, like delays, rerouting, change of destination, flight cancellations, and so on. And we have information about the consequences. If you introduce perturbation, we have information about the consequences that these perturbations have on the workload of the air traffic controllers and of the remote pilots. For example, for the air traffic controller, because we have some rerouting activity, and also this can be of different complexity, on uh, the remote pilot, they must be able to manage the failure and uh, also there are uh, much more interaction between the two. And so we have uh, data about the interaction that are required and the activity that are uh, required to these two figures, air traffic control and remote pilots. If we consider the possible uh, space on which the simulator works, if we consider all the possible operation conditions, that means uh, different type of traffic complexity, uh, we put all of them in this axis. So for each point of this, we have a different type of traffic complexity, for example, different operators training, different aircraft density. We have all the possible operational condition here. And we have uh, all the possible degradation here. This is the space where our uh, simulator work. So it can work with all these conditions where we trigger different initial condition, operational condition, and we trigger different failure. And we investigate all these aspects and provide an output, provide information about those initial conditions. We have. Uh, an input generator that provides input for all these areas, so this initial condition, we have a degradation as second space, so we have a, the one axis here and the other axis here. So we provide this information to the simulator and we can see what are the results. On the, as you have seen in the screen before, and we have also, of course all the data, all the quantitative data that are related to what, what is shown to the graphical user interface. So we can provide those data to the federation of model and analyze the case. So we generate some case with a degradation and with a different input condition, simulate them and provide this to the federation of models and the analyst. And we can analyze those cases and, and study what would happen for us, according to the information provided by the model, for those cases that we generated. So in practice is like, for example, we don't have any degradation, we study two possible scenarios here, or we maybe we generate cause of degradation and we study 
what happens here. So we have the simulator that is uh, moving from this point and we see what happens and study what happens with the, with the model. When, when the CIS, so using the model we have information about what could happen in, a con in some contests that are around the input point that we investigated. Of course, this is offline because for each case that we generate, then we have to stop the system and study the output using the models. So it's an offline approach. And uh, offline approach, of course, is very useful for system evaluation, but cannot be used for monitoring. I mean, uh, the time frame that is uh, required for the human analysis is not compatible with the monitoring purposes. Uh, it's not compatible with the real-time needs. So, since uh, monitoring was one of the things that we wanted to investigate in uh, SPAD, we tried to a monitoring application by exploring in advance a set of cases, limited number of possible future events, and uh, estimate the possible consequences. And then we ran the system and we checked if we were going to be within the space that we investigated, we can then manage the situation and provide information. So, was that try to, let's say, cover an area. We know that these are the area that we investigated that are around the initial points, that are this one. And we know that if our system moves within this area, we know then what is going to happen and we can provide information on how to manage those situations. So for example, if we are in nominal condition, there is no degradation, the system moves here, We, we are able to provide information about what, uh, what, what are the status of the function variability, we will discuss this in a while, in this specific case. Or if there are some degradation, degradation means that the system moves from the oper normal operational condition and there are some degradation, and we stay within the area that we investigated, we can provide information on, on how to manage those degradation. If we go out of the area, we we cannot say anything, and, uh, and if we return to normal condition again, we can say something. This is a just possible example of how the system could behave. In practice, what we have done, is we have generated a set of cases, information about a set of cases. We analyzed them with our federation model. We store the results in our database, and then we just went to the real-time case in which the simulator was uh, running and if uh, we were in the events analyzed, these, the results were shown to, the, to manage the situation. So we populated the database and then used the database populated. W what does uh, this mean? Well, here are the information that the system can provide us. So here we have the monitor, here we have the output of the model's uh, analysis. So, for example, here you see that the uh, remote uh, aircraft is flying from A to B. It is interrupting. Uh, it's, there is uh, the need to generate a safety area because of a, of a, of a problem of communication. Uh, and this is the safety area. The safety area interrupts a commercial path of the, of the aircraft. So this generates some problems that require some rerouting. Uh, we have some problems in the uh, and this situation is analyzed with the model and the output is shown here. And uh, wh what are the outputs? So here you have the four uh, air traffic control center, Roma, Milano, Brindisi and Padova. For each air traffic control center you have the functions that characterize the, uh, the behavior of the, of the control center, so the essential function of the control center. Here you have the aircraft function, here you have some UAS functions. For each function you have the level of variability, the trend, if it is, uh, the, the variability is increasing or not, and if the function is affected by the variability of the previous function that are using them. And so this is, uh, 
a way to provide real-time indication about what is happening and how this is affecting the behavior of the function of the system. And we have some example as well, real-time. I was showing some uh, screenshots from the demonstrator. So here are some movies from the demonstrator. This is an example of rerouting. So here you see an aircraft that is this one. And this is the original path, planet path. And you see that uh, a managed aerial system here generated this safety area because of a problem, and this is the rerouting that is chosen for him. And here you see how this has an influence on the delays, and unfortunately you cannot see from there, but here you see that the delays is affecting the two. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Let me show it once again. So the simulator is a, a, you have an aircraft here, and the simulator allows you to click on the aircraft and see the planet path. So if you click on the aircraft here, you can see that this is the planet uh, route path for this uh, aircraft from going from Venice to Brindisi. And you can also see here that there is a, a managed aerial system. We have a, is not shown. We have a segregated area here and another one here that correspond to the two NATO's area in Italy and the unmanned aerial system is moving from one to the other. While it's moving, we simulate, you will see a screenshot that simulate, ah, sorry, you see here the status, you see that there is almost no delay, this is the column of delay, and these are the number of aircraft that are flying at the moment, and these are just the aircraft that are flying at the moment. We generated a failure, to manage this failure and to deal with the problems that are caused by this failure, there is a safety area that has been created here. This safety area crosses some commercial routes, this one, for example, and this one. So there is a level of communication between the remote pilot of this aircraft, a managed aerial system, and the, and the air traffic controller. The air traffic controller has to reroute all the traffic in order to deal with this problem. And so you see that there is a new route that is generated. And you see all the information concerning the aircraft. And you see that there are now some delays. Most of the delays are in the Rome ACC because uh, what is happening is happening here. This was the original. This is the new one. The delay was increasing uh, with, uh, with time. So this is another case. This is a more complex one. You have a several, several aircraft will be working at the same time in the scenarios. You still have a, a, a managed aerial system. You still have a, a, a safety area that is generated. In this case, the safety area, the problem or the failure is such that the safety area is moving with the supposed position, uh, central position of the unmanned aerial system. And so while it moves, it generates, it interrupts several possible paths. And so there is a continuous problem of managing this interruption that is going along the, the airspace. And the controller has to deal with the continuous interaction in order to, to reroute all the aircraft that are potentially involved. And you see that there is a, uh, here the delay is more significant. And what you can see now are the consequences in, term, in terms of impact on the function. This is, for example, is a, not, is a function that is not concerned. But for some function, you have a certain level of variability, trend of the level of variability, and impact that the other function are having on the concerned one.
This is for, from Rome, and the aircraft is still out of the Rome. It's entering the Rome space now. So if you, you will see that as soon as it breaks some, some uh, path that are in Rome, you will see that the situation is getting worse. At least it should be so. You see the delay is changing from, uh, because of the problem is moving to other ACC, but there is st still some delays because in some cases the rerouting affect other, other uh, uh, ACC. And there should be a, now a point where, maybe later. You see that the total delay is increased, uh, is significantly increased now because of those uh, problems generated by the, by the aircraft. And that's it.
Conclusions. The, we found the approach very useful to support understanding the modeling and the estimation of automation degradation and as the special consequences that this can have in ATM, especially in terms of uh, impact on the function that they have to do. The application in real time for real time monitoring is difficult and time consuming because there is a significant human work, significant human work contribution is required. The approach that we used in SPAD was an offline use of the Federation to explore and advance a certain number of cases that may happen. And uh, this is uh, been effective, but is still uh, expansive in terms of application effort. If you instead use the system as a support to the analysis, this is a much more efficient way to use it. So offline to support the analysis of system. So for example, to support safety assessment or safety analysis. Especially, we have seen a lot of help in uh, supporting the interaction between the analyst and the operational experts and discuss some cases that may happen with the operational effort. There is the need for several instantiation and uh, the application effort also in this case can be high. So you need in that case to focus the analysis on the most relevant part of the system and choose the right level of granularity. So this is something you have to pay attention to in order to have an efficient way to use the system offline. The simulator was very useful because it created different possible realistic cases for the Federation and offered the opportunity to test and improve the Federation on the basis of a realistic usage. These are some insights from the analysis to be taken with some precaution because they were discussed with the operational expert but were cases generated by the simulator that is not the reality anyway. So human and especially air traffic controller are the elements that are more capable of absorbing the consequences of failure and avoid propagation. We had really some problems in generated cases in which the controller said, okay, that can really be a problem. Usually, when we investigated the cases, we made the scenario, we made the analysis, claim of the controller were still, okay, we can manage it for all the cases that were studied. And uh, as soon as we increased traffic and we made the system more efficient with less space between aircraft and try to optimize everything, perturbation are significantly higher. So the effect of perturbation increases a lot when the system are optimized and the capacity is close to the theoretical limits. And that's all for the presentation, so we can have uh, some discussion or question if you want, and I can try to provide some information about the model to Stella. Okay, thank you Alberto. Maybe some time to reflect, is there any question on this side? So Fram and Hamsters and the other one which I've IPO or I IPO was. Uh, yes. If my understanding is correct, it's not that Stella was asking how they were selected and so on and so forth. My understanding is that these are rather new and actually this was almost a test case for Fram, Hamsters and the Federation between them. Is that correct? Yes, we, we made some, some work for the selection. Let me, let me try to... So let me ask it, let, let me ask it another way. Yeah. Have, have they been used for other applications and found to be successful? Not by us, you mean yeah. in general? Yeah. I'm not so familiar with Amster and I let the answer to flip. Uh, as for Fram, there are several uh, partial applications, uh, probably none of the complexity of this one, this, I would uh, say. This quite new, the, the method that has been developed. No, they, they, know, they know it very well. They know the whole uh, story, the so, uh, so they don't need, they, they know, that, that they know. <laughs> has never been applied uh, for prediction. Yeah. Uh, is that, is that been applied uh, partially for the analysis of uh, accidents, uh, and it's uh, the first test on uh, prediction of new events. It has been uh, used for accident analysis, but of course it's, much, it's a much more easy text field. Everybody is able to, to justify what happened in the past using... There are several models that are very good in, in judging what happened in the past. There are some uses for safety assessment, safety analysis, or safety system, uh, system analysis, let's say. So to say, okay, it could be improved in this way, on this other way, or, or, or so. But in that case, uh, you have different functions. The different functions can relate in different ways depending from the scenario that you are considering. So you can, uh, one function can be the 
uh, input for another one in one context, if you generate a different scenario, the other way around could be, or, or maybe there is no relation between those functions anymore. For each scenario you need to generate an instantiation of the model, a study the instantiation of the model. That increases the complexity a lot, because uh, if you want to, to analyze something new, you need to, to generate a new instantiation, and this is time consuming. It sounds to me like it wasn't a huge success, actually, and that's okay. If I would have to choose whether to use FRAM or not, it depends on the ability to, to have the right level of granularity and to choose the right part of the system. If you want to have a full uh, approach in which you use it for everything and you want to be sure about every possible condition, that's no way, it's, it's not practical. If you want to explore some possible critical conditions maybe especially in interaction with the operator and you want to have a nice point of view to show the operator and discuss with him, then, then it's a, it's a probably worthwhile to use it. The main problem for FRAM, again I let Amster, uh, Philip to discuss about Amster, the main problem with FRAM is that it's, a, it's probably more a conceptual model rather than a practical model. It's like uh, if, you, if you were trying to measure the safety of a system using the uh, Groviera model of reason. No? You, you cannot judge, try to measure the, the size, the diameter of the holes. That has no meaning. It's more conceptual rather than a practical method. FRAM is a half way, I would say, half conceptual, half practical. So it offers very good, a very good point of view. It's very, let's say, illuminating from a certain point of view. So when you discuss with the uh, operational expert, you can have a different point of view, you can have a new way to see the system that is very interesting, but you cannot have a comprehensive approach in which you intend to measure everything and you have a number at the end, that's, that's probably uh, would be very, very extremely expensive because of the uh, number of possible future events that you can generate. Amsters belong to the class of task modeling notations. So there are many, and they, uh, they started to be produced in 1967. So with one notation called HTA, which was hierarchical task analysis. And they have been used worldwide, I would say, in many, many domains, uh, starting from training for uh, pilots and, uh, and yeah, nuclear engineers, for instance, in the, in the 70s, I would say. And these task-based notations are meant to describe how operators should behave, what are their goals, and what are the activities they have to carry out for reaching the goal. So that's broad. And we worked for uh, many years with uh, people in Italy, in Pisa, called Fabio Paterno, who designed a, a notation called CTT, which is Conquer Task Tree, which is a kind of Amster, I would say, notation. Uh, while working on this project and other projects with others, we identified limitations of, um, of CTT. And so Amsters is an extension, let's say, of CTT, where we are able, for instance, to represent knowledge and information, for instance, that are passed and managed during the task. And this is not possible in CTT, for instance. So uh, to, to come back to your, uh, your question, yes, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not completely new because the concepts are there for many years and used worldwide. Uh, it's new in the fact that we embed in these notations for tasks also information, knowledge, objects, uh, strategies that are used by the operators. And, and without that, we, you cannot really make a, a very detailed assessment of the complexity. For instance, you don't know how many information people are, have to keep in their mind before acting on the system, and then making prediction on that is very difficult without this knowledge. Okay. So that's a, a kind of mixed uh, answer. Um, for ICO, it is uh, used uh, I would say uh, mainly, as far as I know, by Abbas and, uh, and Thales for the description of the uh, cockpit. So currently in the group we have four people paid by Abbas who are working on this notation for fine grain, as, as uh, Alberto said, fine grain description of interaction in a cockpit. So we work on, on current cockpits like the 380 uh, and the 350 and we work also on new generation of cockpits with tactile interfaces for Abbas and, uh, and they, are, yeah, they are used in detail. They have not been used recently for air traffic management, but in 97 we already were working on that and we had a project, a European project called Milfisto with uh, uh, CDNA in Toulouse, where we did the modeling of uh, uh, double screens for it was, uh, an application called Midas at the time, so for uh, tactile interfaces on, on, on uh, air traffic management applications. Yeah. And so the idea was to blend them. And, and I think what is really 
good uh, with what Alberto said is that Fram is very good for handling very abstract high level views, which is the opposite of hamsters and, um, and icos, which are really at the detail. And this is, uh, to my mind, very important to have these two views because usually in interfaces or human computer interaction, we always say the, the devil hides in the detail. Okay? And, and if you are not able to capture the details in the models, then it's completely useless. Uh, an example is if you interact with uh, your keyboard or your mouse. When you move the mouse, there is a, an acceleration, and this acceleration is extremely important for the performance of the operators. If you are not able to describe that, then you can say there is a mouse and you can click, but you lose all the precise information that makes a difference in interaction. That's why you have the iPhone much better than other phones at the beginning. This was done by interaction, and for instance, in the iPhone, you, they disable any communication capability as soon as you touch the screen. And, and this is the only way to make the interaction efficient enough. So that, that's... Uh, why I think these multiple views are very important. Uh. If you look at FRAM, FRAM works with functions and study the relation between functions and how the input from one function can affect the other. But it doesn't tell you anything about what you have to do inside the function. So if you have a certain input, you have to estimate, as an analyst, have to estimate what this k causes to the output. There are, there are some rules, but, but in general, it doesn't support the analysis of the function itself. So if you have a certain input, you have to look at the function, understand what the function is, what the influence of those inputs could be, and say, OK, this can increase the variability of the output and this has an effect on the other function. Or well, this can reduce the ability to do this and this, and so on. But you have to do this analysis. So for that part of the analysis we found we use, is where we use hamster and in some cases in a small application, ICO. Because uh, sometimes it's not easy to understand what the consequences of a certain input could be for the function. But of course, this is extremely complex. In some cases, we have done it. In some other cases, we have just done an estimation that was based on, on the analyst. In some cases, we just ask the operational expert, what, what do you think will happen if this is the output? And, and this should be done for each instantiation. Some condition means some output. Then that's an instantiation, is a, is a scenario in particular. Then you move it and you say, OK, we are in completely different condition. These are the output. What it will happen, and of course, if you want to do it for everything, the impact is significant. Also, yes, ICO is really made for design, so, so for describing the interactive interface and the, uh, the interactive system itself. And, and we are here more into uh, analysis aspects. And, and if we want to make analysis, with, if you use ICO, you have to do the design as well. So we have to either reproduce a system or design a new system. And, and uh, we have a, a paper in the project at SafeComp, which is a safety and computing conference this year. And we, in order to show in detail how Amsters, ICO, and, and, uh, and FRAM integrate, so we did that in, in detail, we use a very small case study on a very small part of the cockpit, which is just the management of the weather radar in the cockpit. And with this small part, we were able to go very in detail on uh, complexity or uh, multiple uh, distribution of information in different parts of the cockpit and so on, which are important for performance of operators. But to do it at the scale of several ACC and so on, what would have been a much, uh, much more complicated for the project. That's part of the answer for Stella. This is a slide from, from the, let's say, the conclusive part, the other part of the meeting. And it's essentially is about uh, the problem of uh, modeling. And uh, OK, this is about the federation that was de delivered. But we, had, uh, we considered several types of models. In particular, model for system analysis from Amsters, and we also considered we made some study about stamp, and uh, all very effective for providing information about the system, and especially if information that are important for considering the resilience, the ability of the system to manage some situation to deal with the degradation but all requiring a strong human contribution, also stamp. We started focusing on Fram and Amster, we see that there were some potential between the interaction and we selected them. But when we saw some problem with Fram, essentially linked to the effort, then we considered also some other models. But stamp would have not been so different. Of course, we didn't apply it, but from the analysis of the state of the art that we have done, that would have not be that different. Okay, at the Cesar Innovation Days, you mentioned that maybe STAM would have been a better model to be used. 
not, not exactly. That could have been uh, maybe a better a model with different characteristics, maybe better so for some aspect. But the, the effort for, for the application would probably have been the same. Uh, from what we could judge from the state of the art analysis, but not, not from, uh, from uh, we have not used it in depth, so uh, we have not used it at all. We just had a look to the working principles of STAMP, and we still think that there is a strong human contribution. Perhaps could have provided more information than Fram did, but again, Essentially, this remains in the frame of system for our models for system analysis. That's, that's the idea. Because our model that cannot be completely automated. Our model that are designed to support the analyst. So models that are designed to support the analyst can have different ways to support the analyst. Stamp could be better for some, for some aspects. But still, is a, is a model that is designed to support the analyst and not to work on his own. That's the, that's the problem. Okay. Part of the work that we have done and planned was based on the false assumption that we would have been able to use from standalone without too much or at least with a limited uh, level of human uh, effort. But that was not the case. So the conclusion is not to use FRAM, is that correct? Like a research result? No, not pretend to use FRAM without a significant human contribution. Okay. Don't expect okay. that you can use FRAM without a significant contribution from the analyst. So that is one of the major conclusions, basically. Yeah. And you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation that you had like two scenarios. One was yes. for the AMAN and one for ARPAS, but I was not very clear on the AMAN part. What were the conclusions there? This was the first scenario that we used. Uh, the problem with the AMAN is that we were less able to generate problems that propagate to the whole traffic network. We didn't have a simulator for that. We made just a theoretical analysis supported by the operational experts. While with the air pass, the problem were immediately causing some perturbation because of the impact on traffic. With the EMAN, most of the cases that we hypothesized, the operational expert claimed that this would have been easily managed by the controllers. So no propagation. Okay. So essentially no propagation. And so that is why we focus much more on the other case. Okay. Just to conclude, that we use all, we consider also different models, not model for system analysis only. We consider there are a lot of models that regard the transport networks, but most of those models are focused on traffic dynamics. Would be model that could study very well the problem that we simulated, uh, the perturbation, how the perturbation can propagate, what are the impact uh, maybe at the system level, even a larger scale than the Italian airspace that we consider and so on. But these are not models that are telling you anything about the single system, the system where the problem originates, or the impact on the function of the system. That could be a network of, uh, let's say, traffic of any type. That would be the same, they still would work. They are essentially model for transport network. We also consider some model for critical infrastructure, where you can see very well the focus on propagation degradation, but these are tailored for system simple components. So you, if you consider this for an ACC, at the complexity of an ACC, probably those models would have not worked. And this is why after some discussion, uh, we then moved uh, to system. We started with this model because these are the models uh, proposed by the scientists that we have in our uh, consortium. We see some problem, we studied other, other models like again a stamp or, or, or also other model. This was also discussed at the mid-project gate review meeting and uh, we considered the different option and at the end we decided to go ahead with those uh, two models. No, but it's, it's, I mean, 
having a research result like that is also a research result. So not uh, so you shouldn't. I think it's very good to report on it. So actually, even more clearly to state this even in the publishable summary in the conclusion. So to prevent other people to use or repeat the same mistakes. Huh? Don't misunderstand. I don't. I'm not saying that there are not some advantages in system analysis. Huh? I'm... No, no, no. I understood that. The FRAM model could be used, but with significant human contribution. Now, just uh, one, one minute, Alberto. Let's, uh, our air, air traffic control expert, he has some questions he would like to ask you for the simulation, yeah. okay? Yes. Hi. What do you mean by offline simulation? Uh, did you perform fast time simulation or uh, are there some human operators in the loop? No, I mean that we generated this data from with using the simulator, then we stop the simulation, we analyze the data with the model, and that, and that is offline. So we generated some cases, some data, and if you remember in the presentation where there was a slide concerning the data that we generated with simulator. So we, had a, we, we generated a possible problem and uh, we simulated it, and we had a lot of information concerning workload, uh, rerouting, delays, and blah, blah. And then we used the model to analyze what happened to the ability of the system to resist and to, to, to manage those situations. And, and that was the output of using from and upstairs, this was the output. How did you measure the workload? We estimated the workload on the basis of uh, some activities that were required to manage the, that situation. So the increase of uh, relation with the remote pilot, the number of rerouting action that were required, the complexity of the rerouting action, and so on. This was, of course, was a simulator, so we didn't have any, any operator in the loop. So the, the, the real operator, we just had uh, some, some elements, some objective elements that we considered as a, as a factor that could, would have affected uh, the, the workload of the controller. So you take into consideration, as, uh, if I'm not wrong, the whole Italian airspace, am I right? Yes, yes. What was the traffic density that you evaluated in that airspace? How many aircraft? Use, uh, was, uh, was used the basis, uh, the forecasting for the 2020. But we were able to generate different level of traffic, especially because our intention was also to see the influence of a very high optimization of the traffic, so very, very high traffic, very high traffic density. Also to see the ability of, uh, of the system to tolerate problems in those conditions. And this is uh, why the disclaim in the, in the last slide about the conclusion. The more you get close to a very optimal use of the airspace, the more a problem can generate problems in terms of, uh, of course, delays and uh, rerouting, more complex rerouting, but also problems on the ability to deal, uh, to ensure that each function uh, work properly. So the, the variability or the function increase a lot when you have a very high optimization of the space usage and when, and when you generate some problem in those cases of very high traffic density and very optimal usage of the space. That is uh, intuitive, of course. Okay, another thing about the simulation, you, you thought that when your, this path simulator detects something wrong with the RPAS, it, am I right? It generates an alternative route and you uh, look at the effect of this alternative route? Exactly. We, we generate the, the, the failure. Okay. We, generate the, we decide which failure to generate and then, of course, yes, as you, as you said, correct. Okay. In a sense, the effect of an alternative route that was not planned before and the impact on the controllers. In this respect, you, you, have, you define three situations. The most serious one is lack of communication, lack of the radar ADSB data. No radar, sorry, no radar. Lack of ADSB, only radar working. So you have the ability to position the aircraft? Yeah, with less precision, with some uncertainty. So in the, in the most serious case, it, it was the third bullet, uh, I suppose. There is lack of communication. And the thing is, uh, if I'm not wrong, 
you do not know anything about the expected behavior of the RPOS. Exactly. And then it means that you can't assume predicted route, alternative route for, for that case. Correct, correct. But we still have his position with the radar. We still have his position, but we can, es we can expect unexpected maneuver from the uh, aircraft because he can, uh, we, we cannot control it and he cannot control it himself. So that's the worst case, worst possible case. In practice, the consequence is that the safety area must be much larger because you can expect everything in it, yes, yes. considering the speed, of course, of, a, of an air pass that is, in our case, was a, uh, probably one third, I don't remember, but significantly lower than the speed of the commercial aircraft. So which conclusion did you achieve? What, uh, what are the consequences, domino, this domino effect about ARPAS malfunction? in capacity, you said, in the uh, controller workload, and what are the others that you achieved? Let's say that our first aim was not to investigate the problem of, uh, of, the, of the air pass, because uh, we want to generate problems, essentially, and see the ability of the system to deal with those problems. Could have been an incredible, travel, let's say, weather perturbation, some type of uh, hurricanes, could have probably worked as well because they were generating problems in some areas, significant problems in some areas. And we want to see the ability of the system to, to, to tolerate those problems and to see if the model was, but again, was simulated. So this was more to test if the system was good in providing those information rather than to have a conclusion about the problem. So the problem was still a simulated problem, not a real problem. So our intent was not to see what will happen if an aircraft doesn't work, but the question was more, will our system, uh, our federation work well in providing information in those cases? And the answer was yes, but offline. I mean, if I want to use it online, then there are uh, probably a lot of uh, additional work to do. Okay, Alberto, thank you very much. I just wanted to make a small recommendation on the publishable summary that what you mentioned about the AMAN scenario, you also please add it in the publishable summary to be more clear why it wasn't used, because when you read the summary, it's not very clear. I think the scenarios were good, which you selected, especially the RPAS one. And my just last question is related a bit to the lessons learned for the project. So I wanted to understand what aspects would you have liked or chosen to improve for the project management from a contractual point of view? How long do we have? Well, actually, what I was going to propose was to probably invite you to the SGU uh, for a discussion because uh, I, I read the project lessons learned and uh, there is some, and some of the... It seems that you encountered many problems and exactly. you want to in, figure that out. So, uh, no, not really, I just put uh, positive and negative aspects. Yes, so this is why I was thinking it could be a good idea that you, maybe we can sit in the SGU and discuss a bit better so we can also improve uh, our processes or we can discuss on what are the aspects you would have liked to see better working or, for example, is there other things which you would have liked to see significantly to improve? But that's why I think it could be a good idea to, to meet and discuss. Stella, this is part of the gate meeting we have in the afternoon, of course. Ah, okay, okay. Yes, this is not about the technical presentation, which is what we're having now. In the afternoon, <coughs> we have the, the, the administrative closeout meeting where we discuss okay. these issues. So this is like, for example, is uh, summarizing what what we achieved in yeah. terms of uh, modeling. Is that was part of the what we have achieved, what we have not achieved, and, uh, and the discussion we we'll have on a closure that, meeting. I understand that, but maybe there could have been some better impact to some of your research results for certain things. That's why I just mentioned it. But it's okay. I, that's why I invited you that we discuss tete-a-tete -tete as the 
those French say. Okay, yeah. well. Anyway, I will be happy to discuss uh, with you or to come to Brussels if you want. But we will try to clarify these lessons learned uh, in the afternoon. And if you know that Dirk is accumulating all these lessons learned from all the projects. And I think that is the level at which the SGU should start to discuss these issues because if they start to repeat, they become much more important. No, no, I understand this. I just, when I read the last page on the project Lessons Learned, I thought that there were some aspects where they, maybe the consortium, project consortium partners would have liked to change or uh, on a, improve the project to uh, maybe introduce new partners who are working on various different models, so which could have had a better impact on the actual research results. That's why I mentioned it. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention it only from, a, from an administration point of view. I'm mentioning it from a research point of view. That's why I mentioned it, but let's discuss a bit later then. Well, thank you very much. Alberto uh, and uh, the consortium you. partner. Thanks you. So, and I think uh, you have said some good scenarios and actually your conclusions, we encourage you from the SGU part also to be more open about the conclusions you have came into these projects because these are lessons learned for these two models for the Fram and the hamsters, which having that type of results are also very much relevant and giving recommendations, especially in the context of future research areas ought to follow up or to build up or not to build up, it's also a conclusion. Okay. Thank you, Stella. And with that, I would like to conclude the technical part of the meeting. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you.